hello to everybody who's tuning in for this uh, great event here uh, for Heyday Books. And I'm really glad that you're tuning in and that you're interested in, you know, my latest with Heyday and their, among their whole great uh, corpus of work that they put out this year in a, in a strange time of pandemic. Uh, you know, my latest patriotic descent, America in the Age of Endless War, uh, has been a, a great project. I'm so glad to do with Heyday. And for this, you know, brief little chat here, I'm really glad to have uh, the great director, Vietnam veteran, you know, critic, intellectual thinker, Oliver Stone with me. We have had some really interesting conversations over the past few months. And we're going to chat a bit about the themes of patriotism in both of our works. And it's, uh, it's been, first of all, an amazing opportunity uh, to have the space and, and to some extent the prompt in a weird sense from, from Heyday, from Steve Wasserman in particular, to write this book. And I've been thinking about a lot of these issues throughout my own experience in Iraq and Afghanistan and teaching back at West Point, a lot of evolving views. And I've constantly been ruminating on patriotism and uh, really the, the, the genesis. And I think this is an interesting thing. I've published a book with another publisher, a university press, and uh, never before did I get a challenge or an assignment from you know, an editor at a website, Truth Dig, Bob Shear, and a, uh, a member of a press up in Berkeley who basically said during a conversation about patriotism, its philosophy, I made the comment at a trip in LA with Steve and Bob and said, I don't think we're going to end the endless wars until we at least reframe the philosophy of patriotism. And both Bob and Steve, Bob said, well, then you need to write it. And, and Bob turned to Steve and said, and you need to publish it. And Steve said, how fast can you write it? Uh, and so that's been pretty interesting. Uh, the start point for a lot of it was Bob Shear's constant question, of, of maybe a provoking, if you know Bob Shear at all, uh, is patriotism toxic? And uh, frankly, I think most authors write a book and they already have their thesis in mind, even if it's a scholarly work. Uh, I actually wasn't so sure how I was going to answer this or what the book would be. Uh, I thought about saying patriotism is toxic, toxic. We should throw the whole baby out with the bathwater. In the end, in the book, I come down on the side of, in a time of crisis, it would be obscene uh, not to aspire to a different kind of patriotism that uh, tries to be the best version of ourselves. And uh, this is an interesting moment for this book to come out. It was not planned this way, but maybe the title should have been patriotism in a time of pandemic. Uh, to play on the Spanish author's novel. But this journey, you know, of early writing, uh, early descent uh, that I've taken along with Heyday, it brought me into contact with a lot of interesting people. It's not the only reason, but there are a lot of connections. And, and one of those folks over the last few months uh, is the great Oliver Stone, who had uh, been connected to Bob Shear uh, previously in life. And in one sense, I think his work, if I may, Oliver, uh, life and work has at varying levels been, you know, an analysis, uh, a, a commentary on some of the same themes, among others, of patriotism, Americanism, the human condition itself, whether it's Platoon or Salvador to Born on the Fourth of July, Heaven and Earth, and even the untold history sort of nonfiction documentary that was really such a, a great work to his own new book, which is out now, you know, relatively new, Chasing the Light. And we've spoken so much about this, uh, a memoir that really leads up to, to your 40th year, Oliver, just a little bit older than I am now. So with that, you know, that's a long way of saying to what extent, Oliver, and we've had these conversations, but maybe not on this exact inflection, you know, how has your art, career, and life experience been influenced by evolving views on patriotism, Americanism, nationalism. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Danny. Nice build up there. Uh, I think your approach is very intellectual and I, I, I respect that. Anya. You, you surprised me uh, when I first met you. Here was a soldier who had been in Afghanistan who was able to write about it in a very clear cut and strong protesting manner. I was that's uh, obviously uh, I respected you for having served, for having believed and having felt like you were duped. And then the more you investigated it, it seemed like you 
we're getting more and more, you, you realize where the garbage was and the rubbish we hear. And that's very important because people don't go far enough. They say, oh, that war was a bummer. This was that, blah, blah, blah. And they drift off into some kind of semi-obsolescence. You stayed with it, you attacked it, and you keep going after it. And there's numerous examples of corruption in war. And I think you've pointed out many of them. In Vietnam, uh, it, I was young and 21, 22, and I served. I, I didn't complain. I went there and I volunteered. My father was conservative, lieutenant colonel in World War II. And I bought the whole uh, storyline about communism in Asia. Uh, but of course, what I saw was with my own eyes and experience as a soldier was different than what was written about, propagandized to me about why we were fighting it. There was no sense of fighting an ideological foe that was threatening the United States. It was a local affair, fought over independence of Vietnam. They'd been fighting this war for centuries. It's an old war for independence. It went against the Chinese, it went against the French, and they, then it went and the Japanese, and then it morphed into an American war. It was completely fraudulent in its beginnings, in its origins, in our intention, in what we were talking about. We had to lie our way into the war. We all know about the Tonkin Gulf incidents and the numerous other things that occurred under Lyndon Johnson, but this is not the place to discuss them. The patriotism issue came up later, not in the war. Uh, I found in the war itself, there were two different groups of people generally breaking it down into the, uh, the Elias faction, let's call it red state, blue state, if you want, people who really believed that we had to just go through with this. And many of them I found were racist against the Vietnamese and were willing to kill them rather, ra rather without thinking. And there was another element uh, that was against that. It was many of them were black soldiers too, because it was not their war they felt. And here they were fighting Oriental people and killing them. And why? They were sort of, it just was part of the senselessness of it. They didn't see the concept driving the war of patriotism. So I would say there was a big divide in, in Vietnam as there may be in, in later wars, but I think it was because well, you, you, have, you can talk about the modern wars. I'm talking about the Vietnam. When, at that point, the issue of patriotism became an issue. And that was an ugly one because you go back to the States and love it or leave it was the idea. You know, if you don't like it, get out. All these kids, 200,000 of them went up to Canada and they were to avoid the draft. And frankly, they were men of conscience. They actually did something. They didn't want to serve and they left. And of course, that was a big issue. People wanted to punish them. And eventually they were pardoned by, I believe, Carter, President Carter. But that was when you, I started to hear this love it or leave it business. And I've heard it all my life now because I became a critic of the, of the country, not only of Vietnam, but eventually of our policies of warfare in general and our aggression and our trying to police the world and being a, a, an imperial empire, basically with 900 bases all over the world, almost every country. And then the CIA working as a, a softer version of the military, but not really uh, as, a, as, a, as another kind of an army, capitalism's ar invisible army, they called it. And they did a great job of subverting governments, spoiling elections, doing all kinds of hokey pokey, hanky panky stuff and upsetting the process of natural process of people's wishes being expressed in various forms of elections. And uh, it, the world has been, we lost, there must have been an America before World War II, I believe, that was, it was more isolationist, but we, we minded our own business. Somewhere in World War II, the internationalists, the globalists got control of this government's policy and they have been basically ramming it down our throats for 70, 80 years. Uh, and it's in the name of democracy, it's in the name of freedom. These are very vague terms and very subjective terms I found in my lifetime. Uh, so patriotism is an issue that is really haunted America and blinded it. And we're now in these wars that have nothing to do with our well-being as a country or our national security, nothing at all. 
they're trying to tell us that we have to control everything from China to Russia on all borders, and we have to lay down an international order. Well, that won't work. Clearly it won't work because it's, it's already, it's leading to so many problems where we have engaged. We're now in state, state of alert against Venezuela, against Cuba, against Iran, against North Korea, against Russia, which is most dangerous of all, and China. I, I see, and at the same time, I'm, uh, I'm enough of an American to really wonder, why is there no peace party in this country? Why, what happened to this? When John Kennedy was president, I, I, I liked what he said at the uh, peace speech in June 63. He said, I'm talking about peace. He says, I'm talking not about a Pax Americana governed by weapons of war, but a real peace for everybody, a peace that can work for the Russians, a peace that can work for the Chinese. He was broad in his generosity and that, was a vision of America that really works. It's, it's not enforcing peace, it's letting it happen because it's a natural state. There will always be disputes, yes, but as Franklin Roosevelt once said, these have a tendency of going away, these disputes. Let them pass, let live and let live. Uh, Roosevelt and Kennedy were much more in the American tradition for me than uh, the presidents that have followed because essentially I feel the American government has been captured by the intelligence agencies and the war state, the, the Pentagon. That's where the big money is. Uh, the lobbies, the people who work for them, the contractors is enormous business, trillions of dollars spent every year. And uh, it's, it's, we're in a grip of that. It's a form of slavery. We have no talk of peace in our country, no talk of peace. We only talk about enemies. Something is fatally wrong with this concept of quote, patriotism. You know, so much of what you said, Oliver, is, is, is resonant because on one angle, I want to say, wow, you know, the Vietnam War to most people was ancient history. Uh, I was kind of a historically inclined even child. So it was, it was there for me. But I think about how we're an intergenerational connection. We fought in wars of two different generations. And yet so much has kind of repeated itself. And that's a bit of a cliche because there are changes. And I think what you said about the lack of a peace movement uh, is, is very important. And, and that's a big change to a certain extent from your generation. And uh, it involves the way we frame patriotism because if patriotism is just pageantry, if it's just hegemony, if it's just my country right or wrong, uh, this, this is a, this really, ties into more chauvinist nat nationalism, which is an accident of birth. And the fact that that didn't go obsolete when a million soldiers died in the first four months of World War I uh, is, is crazy. But you mentioned a time before World War II. And, and just two days ago, I was giving a speech at the, the graveside of Smedley Butler, the Marine general who some people have heard of, but a lot of folks have forgotten right out there. And uh, why is there no Smedley Butler today? is a corollary to why is there no peace movement today? And in one sense, you could say because the draft has taken a lot of responsibility from the people. So now I served really in a, a Praetorian Guard type of professionalized, nearly a foreign legion, except with our own people and lots of immigrants, interestingly. But the or, the or this was actually organized, this event, by libertarian anti-war veterans who were self-styled Republicans, some of whom like Trump. And that's interesting because I think it shows that there's a lack of a mainstream sort of Democratic Party or a mainstream peacenik kind of group so that that ground has been seeded. And, and I think that that's particularly dangerous, but there are rumblings. I mean, there are reasons for hope in the sense that there are rumblings among soldiers across the boundaries, even in this volunteer force. It seems that the volunteer army was was designed in order to just become the tool of the pageantry patriot, one of the three types I showed. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about some of your films as they relate to this, but one of the things that I noticed about soldiers coming back, and you said how, you know, you and I have certainly had a different uh, timeline of, of when we got active in, in dissent, but also different experience in terms of officer enlisted, but we were both 
ground troops with using our, our boots mostly. And we both saw that the gap between what they told us and what we needed to do, what we were really doing was different. I found that about, you know, most soldiers who've come back in this professional force today, and this may have been similar to Vietnam, were, you know, about 40% of them are, they still hate and they're racist against the Afghans and, uh, and the Iraqis, which is odd because they're patriots too, just for their own country. Uh, about 50% though of my, and I'm talking about hundreds of guys that I still know, are just apathetic. You know, they don't believe we're going to win, but they're just like professional nihilists, sort of like nothing can be done. And really only a small crew is a participatory. And so I wanted to ask, you know, kind of as our last little bit here, you know, in some of your take platoon and born on the 4th of July, for example, um, they're very different, uh, but they run into some of the same themes. You know, one is more about the journey. It's more about the journey from belief to seeing the gap and follow through to actually getting active in descent through Ron Kovic, who we both know uh, and have a, the pleasure to know. But in Platoon, of course, is more brotherhood at the ground level. But the thing that was interesting about Platoon to me is that you complicated that notion of brotherhood. Uh, most of the time it's, oh, it doesn't matter if you're fighting for your country because you just love your brothers. But you showed that there was a tribal and civil war aspect in the film and in your experience. And, uh, you know, briefly, you know, how, how, how did that complicate your view of, you know, patriotism, what this is all for fighting for your country? Because you didn't just fall for the platitude. No, but I never fell, I never fell for the West Point thing, which they always hear about either. Cause I didn't, I was not educated in the military. I just went in as a young man and I was trying to survive and be good and do, do my job. And I became a good soldier eventually. Although I, I never told you, but the first time I saw a Viet an NVA at night running towards me <laughs> across a rice paddy, I froze. Totally, all my training went out the window the first time I saw one. And the guy in the next hole fired his claymore, so that kicked off the thing. And uh, thank God, because I, I don't know if I, I was, I was just frozen. I, how could I kill another human being? He was running at me and he, well, he didn't know I was there. He was just in this direction. And, it was a night ambush and uh, I got wounded that night, but that was, I was just thinking about the other day, how, how difficult it is to make that first kill, to, to do something, you know, it's not, it's not natural. It's not a natural thing to fire a rifle and kill somebody. And make no mistake. I, there were many days I tell people that you're not a coward or a, or a hero every day, yeah. all the time. Most of the time you go back and forth because the number of times I hid behind my Humvee and, pretended to talk on the radio and the next day maybe I did well. What I saw in platoon and I was in four different platoons three of them were combat platoons 25th infantry and then up first cavalry and uh it was every it was all over the place it was this divide there was people of a certain type who preferred to smoke marijuana and hang out and listen to music and I thought they kept the situation they kept the they kept the atmosphere human. In, in other words, you'd go back to the rear, not in the field, you'd go back to the rear and you'd have some moments of R&R, &R, relaxation. You could hang out with guys in your troop, smoke dope, listen to some, uh, to Motown or in some cases, psychedelic rock and hang out. And that kept, that was so important to the morale of, of certain people. Then there was another group that came back and what they do, they played poker and they, and they drank a lot and they acted pretty macho. They thought people who smoked grass were really stupid and retarded and uh, something was wrong with them and they were alien to them. But there was a good split in these platoons. I mean, we had a lot of black soldiers and so a lot of them smoked dope. I mean, what, so did I. I, I got into it and it kept me human. Kept me human. I came back from that war. Yeah, I was still a human being. And some of those guys came back from that war. They were really screwed up because they never allowed themselves to have human feelings towards not only the enemy, but towards the civilians. Killing civilians uh, or hurting civilians was often an out outlet for people who couldn't get to the enemy. They couldn't find the enemy. The enemy was out there. Remember, Milai, those guys never had contact with the enemy they were blown up by the enemy they were mined they were ambushed if you remember the story of the 199th they got to that town that that village that day and they were in a bad mood man they were told there was nva nobody was in the village except nva and what they do they slaughtered 500 plus people women children in that village 
not one enemy shot was fired at them. That was a degree of built up rage. And that is only because of they just couldn't find the enemy that they were supposed to be finding. They wanted people to shoot at them, but nobody was shooting at them. So you create the, uh, you create the, the violence. And that's often the case. I know in Afghanistan, there was a lack of presence of the enemy at one point. I know that they were patrolling the, I heard they were patrolling the place and they were going back through and through these villages and creating tension where there was no tension. In other words, they'd won the war early on, but they didn't know it. And they, 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 they stayed on until the enemy began to appear as if willed into being. Um, I mean, that, that's great because it, I think what it demonstrates to me is that, you know, in Afghanistan, I once described on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, they sent a reporter from Reuters to me, to my little outpost, because, you know, I was from New York and I had a firefighter family. So who better to get the comment? And I got in some trouble because I was the first time I was ever in print uh, in any newspaper. I said, uh, you know, I don't see any connection to 9-11 here in southern Afghanistan. I'm not fighting Al Qaeda. How can you hate teenage farm boys with guns? And I was quoted as saying that. And I couldn't really get in any real trouble, but the, uh, my colonel said, oh, did you really have to say that? You couldn't just give them what they wanted. You had to complicate things. Uh, and I think that, you know, as we wrap up here, you know, your, your work complicated everything from the start because your experience did and, you, and your thinking did. And you said, you know, you, you have Chris Taylor speaking and saying that we didn't fight the enemy, we fought ourselves and the enemy was in us. And so as I'm, you know, thinking about this patriotism issue today, uh, everyone talks about tribal times, divided country. And I think the point is that our soldiers are not above that. They're not some adulated separate class. Um, but at the same time, you know, I am, I'm never optimistic, but I think there are cautious reasons for hope to a certain extent in that, you know, 73% of Afghan veterans are against that war now for a variety of reasons. And I think the question is whether, you know, we're going to fight internally and let ourselves be duped, or if the, at least some of the military folks are going to form a vanguard of dissent uh, and try to catalyze folks towards a new view of it and understanding that, like Martin Luther King said, we shouldn't, you know, confuse disloyal, you know, disloyalty and dissent. But, um, well, uh, as always, you know, we love, we love talking about these issues and, and Oliver and I, and I can go on about this probably indefinitely. No one has ever accused me of being uh, too brief. And I, I doubt that that's a singular experience for the two of us. But uh, thank you again to the audience, the attendees for tuning in to a, a new kind of uh, a festival, but, uh, but hopefully also uh, equally great. And uh, thank you for your interest in, in my book, Patriotic Descent and Oliver's Chasing the Light. And I think that just having these conversations and carrying them home with you is a step in the right direction. Keep an eye out because we're going to be active with these issues, not just talking about them. So thank you very much for coming.